Now, when I say that, the um, obvious question that I'm sure pops into many of your heads is, how is this guy with an American accent, how did he end up being Putin's number one enemy? And so, I'd like to tell you the story. Now, indeed, I'm from America. I was born in New Jersey and grew up in Chicago. But I come from an unusual American family. My grandfather, Earl Browder, was from Wichita, Kansas, and he was a labor union organizer in the 1920s. And he was so good at organizing the union that in 1927, um, he was spotted by the international wing of the Communist Party. And they said, if you like labor unionism, you're gonna love communism, why don't you come and check it out? And so in 1927, Earl Browder went to Moscow um, where he did what, what many young American men do when they get to Moscow. He found a pretty girl who became my grandmother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, my father was then born in Moscow. And in 1932, the whole family moved back to New York um, where Earl, my uh, grandfather, became the general secretary of the American Communist Party for the next 13 years. Wow. He ran for president twice against Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940 on the communist ticket. He was then imprisoned by Roosevelt in 41, um, pardoned by Roosevelt in 42, expelled from the Communist Party in 1945 for being too capitalist. <laughs> and then persecuted in the 1950s by Senator Joseph McCarthy for being a communist. <laughs> this was my family legacy. I, I was born in 1964, and um, in the 1970s, I, I went through a teenage rebellion. And as I looked at ways of expressing my teenage rebellion, um, I came up with a perfect way to upset my parents. Uh, from, from coming from a communist family, I put on a suit and tie and became a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing that I could do that would upset my family more than that. So I became a capitalist, and then um, in 1987, I enrolled at Stanford Business School, which is one of the bastions of capitalism in America. <laughs> and, um, and as I went through business school, one of the things that most people do when they go through business school is try to figure out what they're going to do after business school. And... Um, I, I didn't get excited by all the um, uh, all the on-campus recruiting um, opportunities that were there. None of them sort of touched me in a personal way. Um, and then I had this epiphany one day, which was that if my grandfather was the largest communist in America, um, and I should point out, 1989 was a very significant year, because that was the year that the Berlin Wall came down, um, I was going to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe, and that's what I set out to do. So I moved to London in 1989, and I get a job at an American consulting firm, the Boston Consulting Group, in, um, in London. And I tell them that I want to be working on Eastern Europe, and they said, if, if we have anything to do in Eastern Europe, then uh, for sure you'll be our guy, because nobody else wants to do any work in Eastern Europe. <laughs> and one day they came to me about six months later and said, you were the one who wanted to work in Eastern Europe, well now we have our thing for you. <clears throat> we want you to go to the... Um, southeast corner of Poland to a little town called Sanok to do um, to advise a bus company that's failing in Sanok on their bus problems. So I go out to this little town and it wasn't, it, the bus company had lost 90% of their revenues because the state bus uh, transportation company wasn't buying their buses anymore and there's really nothing I could do and it was very, uh, from a professional standpoint, it was very demoralizing. Um, but one day my um, translator, uh, came into the office and he was carrying this newspaper with him which had all of these uh, financial figures on the front page. And um, uh, I asked him, well, what's, what's in your newspaper? He said, oh, these are the very first privatizations of Poland. I said, interesting. Could you um, explain a little more to me? So we put the newspaper on the, on the desk or the conference table. And I said, well, what is this, what is this number right here? Uh, he said, that's the number of shares outstanding. And, and what is this number right here? That's the share price. And so I did the math. And it, the number of shares outstanding times the share price uh, got to $80 million, which meant that was the value of the company. And then we moved down the, the, um, the, the newspaper a little bit more. And I said, what's this number right here? He said, that's last year's profits. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. And I said, that couldn't be, because the number on that line was $160 million. 
So $80 million was the value of the company, and $160 million was the profits. Now, <laughs> you don't have to be a Stanford MBA to know that the company <laughs> is trading at, at, at um, half the, the um, value of its profits. That must be a good investment opportunity. So, um, so I decided, I thought about it overnight, and I thought, this is exactly what I went to business school for, was to do something about these types of opportunities. So I decided to go all in on Polish privatizations. All in at that time um, was $2,000. So, <laughs> so I, I invested my $2,000. And, um, uh, and, and about a year later, um, my $2,000 had turned, turned into $20,000 and gone up 10 times. <coughs> Now, I don't know how many of you here in this room have ever had a 10 dagger in the investment world. Um, but let me tell you something. If you have one, uh, it releases a certain chemical in your stomach. <laughs> and, and you want to repeat that experience over and over and over again. And so from that moment on, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my career, which is not um, uh, anything other than, than repeating the exercise of finding things that went up 10 times in value in the Eastern European privatization world. <clears throat> Fast forward a couple of years, I end up at Solomon Brothers. It's an investment bank that doesn't exist anymore, but, but um, many people in this room will know the name because it, it was immortalized in a book called Liar's Poker. Um, I ended up at Solomon Brothers working on the East European investment banking team. To, and as an investment banker, my job was to uh, do advisory work on privatizations and other such things. And my first assignment was to advise um, a fishing fleet located 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle on their privatization. Um, and what happened was the management of this fishing fleet had hired Solomon to advise on whether or not they should exercise their legitimate right under the privatization program to buy 51% of this fishing fleet. So I fly up to Romance, which is quite a ordeal getting to. I get off the airplane, and the head of the um, fishing fleet uh, picks me up at the airport, takes me down to the docks, and he takes me on a tour of one of their fishing boats. And, and to call it a fishing boat is, is, is probably a, an understatement. This was a, an enormous ocean-going going factory. It was like several hundred feet long, and they would put out the nets and catch the fish, and then they'd take the fish and put them down below deck, and then they would put them through all sorts of machines, and then they'd come out in cans. And this was a major operation. And I asked him, how much do you um, pay for one of these ships? And he said, we buy them new from Germany, they cost about $20 million. I said, okay, how many of the ships do you have? 100. So if you do the math, 20 times 100 gets you to $2 million. I said, how old is the fleet? And uh, he said, about seven years. So I did a little math in my head, about seven years, maybe half depreciated, so we have a billion dollars worth of ships. And then I said, what, what is the price at which the government wants to sell you 51%? And he said, two and a half million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me just repeat this. A billion dollars worth of ships, and you can buy 50, the management can buy 51% for two and a half million dollars. Now, that, that chemical started to accumulate. <laughs> I wanted to buy some of this stuff myself. <laughs> The problem um, was that this was not for me, this was for them. And so, But I, I didn't want to go back to London, um, which is where I was scheduled to go back, because I thought, if this is, maybe this is just an anomaly with this fishing fleet, but if this is going on, I want to get involved. And so I, um, I got on a flight to Moscow. I, I didn't speak a word of Russian. I didn't know anybody in Moscow. didn't know anything really about Russia. Um, <clears throat> I, and at the airport, I bought a, an English yellow page directory, a very thin little English yellow page directory. And I, I uh, took a taxi um, to, to the Metropole Hotel and I was charged four or five times the going rate to get there. And, and then the next day I started going through the yellow page directory and cold calling anybody who would talk to me about the Russian privatization program. And I ended up getting about 40 meetings that week. And by the end of the week, I discovered that, that what Russia was doing um, in their privatization program created probably the, the most unbelievable investment opportunity that it ever it has ever happened and will ever happen in the history of investments. And the story was this, that, that um, in order to go from communism to capitalism, uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin, who was the president of Russia at the time, uh, said that the best way to do that is to create um, uh, capitalists, and the best way to create capitalists is to give everybody property so that they own something. And so they came up with this idea, they called it the voucher privatization program. 
And the voucher privatization program was meant uh, to give every person over the age of 18 a physical voucher. And those physical vouchers um, were freely tradable. You could keep it, you could invest it, you could sell it, you could do anything you wanted to. There was no restriction on foreigners or domestics or anything like that. And, um, uh, and the vouchers traded for about uh, $20 each. And so again, if you do the math, there was 150 million vouchers in circulation. Times $20 gets you $3 billion worth of um, uh, vouchers. And those $3 billion worth of vouchers were exchangeable for 30% of all the share capital of all Russian companies, which meant that the market value of Russia, the entire country, was $10 billion. Just to put this in some perspective for you, um, this, this country holds 35% of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, 10% of the world's steel, 10% of the world's aluminum, fertilizer, with electricity companies that span 12 time zones, everything. <clears throat> and the entire value of the whole country was $10 billion. So I go back to Solomon Brothers with my with just my eyes wide open because I, this is like the most unbelievable thing. They're giving money away for free. And I get back there and I, I tell everybody who will listen, let's, let's not bother with any of this nonsense advisory work. Let's not bother with anything else. We should be buying this stuff. We should be buying it in size. And the moment that I said Russia, everybody just shut down. Like, it didn't matter what, what I said after I, I, I mentioned the word Russia. There was no interest whatsoever. And I wasn't a very good um, corporate politician. I wasn't very good at sort of maneuvering through the sort of intricacies of the corporation. And so if one person wouldn't listen to me, I would just go talk to somebody else. And what I didn't realize is that I was just fully discrediting myself across the entire um, operations of Solomon Brothers. I used to hang around with a bunch of guys my age, and we would have lunches together and drinks together. But when I, when, after my credibility had sank, they stopped, started to shun me and avoid me for lunches and drinks because they didn't want their careers to be badly affected by being connected to me. And I was on the verge of being fired when one day a partner in New York um, uh, heard about my <coughs> Russian stuff, invited me to New York. I showed him the map that I just showed with you, and he said, that sounds ridiculous and unbelievable. And he allocated me $25 million for me to invest in Russia. Wow. I invested the $25 million at the end of 1993, and in July of 1994, The Economist magazine wrote an article called Sale of the Century, in which they described, again, the same map that I showed with him and I'm showing with you today. And about 25 or 30 people uh, showed up trying to buy Russian shares. And those 25 or 30 people bid up the price of Russian stocks um, over the course of like three weeks so our $25 million portfolio became $125 million. And all of a sudden, all of those guys who weren't inviting me to lunch and drinks were at my desk in the morning waiting for their Russian stock tips. Um, and and the, um, uh, the most interesting thing, thing that happened was that uh, all of the um, top salesmen of Solomon Brothers started to come to my desk and say, Hey, Bill, would you, would you be willing to um, explain to George Soros what's going on in Russia? Um, uh, Sir John Templeton would really like to meet with you. Would you, would you have time for a meeting with him? You know, um, how about Julian Robertson? These are all names, if you don't know these names, of famous investors. Um, I was 29 years old. Of course, I was going to meet with George Soros and Sir John Templeton. And so I went around and had these meetings, and, and at the end of each meeting, they all, um, they all said to me, um, Bill, this is unbelievable. Can we give you some money to manage? And at the time, uh, we were just managing our own money, we weren't managing other people's money. And so um, I went to the, to the head of the trading floor at Solomon Brothers and I said, hey, can we manage other people's money? He said, that's a genius idea. Let's form a task force to study it. <laughs> <laughs> so I show up at the first task force meeting and there are something like 40 people in the room and uh, 38 of them I'd never seen before in my life. There were senior managing directors, managing directors, junior managing directors, senior directors, directors, et cetera, et cetera, and me. And they all got into a big fight about who was going to get the economic credit for this business. And they were very persuasive. I was watching, it was like watching a boxing match. It just, everyone was going at it with each other. I was very, very impressed with how these people who had never been to Russia or knew anything about what I was doing were somehow claiming economic credit. And I didn't know who was gonna win the fight. What I knew for sure is that I was, there was one person who wasn't gonna get any economic credit in this business. <laughs> so I decided to quit Solomon. Um, I hung out my own shingle. I called it Hermitage Capital, and um, I moved to Moscow. Uh, 
the beginning of 1996. And I ended up getting one of those investors, a man named Edmund Safra, who's the owner of Republic National Bank of New York, to put up the first $25 million. And we got started at a time right before the 1996 elections. And this was a time when Yeltsin was running against uh, a communist competitor. And it, didn't, it wasn't clear that Yeltsin was going to win. It actually looked like the communist was going to win. So the market had gotten very depressed prior to the election. And we put all of our money to work before the election. And then um, Yeltsin uh, pulled it out in, in, in the end and won. And by the time I was done, um, 18 months after I started, um, I was up 800% in 18 months. My fund was the best performing fund in the world um, in 1997. We had gone from $25 million of assets under management to more than a billion dollars of assets under management. The uh, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Time Magazine, Business Week were all uh, featuring me as a new financial wonderkin. My, uh, Clients were sending me their private jets to take me to their yachts to toast my financial brilliance, and I was 33 years old. Now, any of those things, uh, being featured in the New York Times, being the best performing fund manager in the world, uh, being 33 would be fine by themselves. But if you put them all together into one package, that is the biggest sell signal there ever was. <laughs> <laughs> but I was 33. And so I thought that the prices were going to go to the sky, that nothing um, bad could ever happen. And for those of you old enough to remember, uh, 1998 wasn't a good year for Russia. Um, uh, 1997, the um, Asian currency started to devalue and led to an Asian uh, debt crisis. And then the Russian government had their own debt crisis. And in August 1998, the Russian government defaulted on their bonds, the um, ruble devalued by 75%, and my billion dollar portfolio went down 90%. I lost $900 million. And let me tell you, that does not feel very good. <laughs> it doesn't feel good to lose money for yourself, but it feels much worse when you lose other people's money who have relied on you and trusted you. And I was feeling particularly mortified about having emphatically told people that they should invest with me and then having lost them such a spectacularly large amount of money. And so I was determined to uh, make the money back. Well, that, that was nice in, in theory, but while I was determined to make the money back, um, there was another group who were determined um, that I and everybody else wouldn't, who were these um, Russian oligarchs. As you probably all know, there are about 22 oligarchs who ended up uh, patrolling about 40% of the country. And those 22 oligarchs um, also owned a majority share of all the companies that I had investments in. And prior to 1998, these oligarchs had what I would describe as they sort of behaved themselves. They, um, uh, they had been all visited by investment bankers from Wall Street, from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, who had said to them, um, if, you, if you don't scandalize your, your shareholders, your minority investors, um, then there's a good possibility to get you free money on Wall Street. Um, and uh, any, any self-respecting oligarch would like the idea of getting free money on Wall Street. And so they kind of behaved themselves. But then after 1998, it didn't matter whether you were behaved or misbehaved, nobody was going to give you any money from Wall Street no matter what. And so the incentive to behave themselves had completely disappeared. But at the same time, there was no disincentive to misbehave. There were no laws or regulator, regulators or anything that caused anybody any grief. And so if you're an immoral or amoral oligarch and, the, and there's no more incentive to behave, no disincentive to misbehave, what do you do? Well, um, they embarked on an orgy of stealing, which has been unprecedented in the history of business. They did asset stripping, transfer pricing, embezzlements, dilutions, in the most sophisticated and brazen manner you could ever imagine. And there I was with my last 10 cents on the dollar trying to uh, make it back when, when the last 10 cents, 10 cents was going to be stolen. So by <clears throat> economic necessity, I had to become a shareholder activist in Russia. And my, my most famous case of shareholder activism involves a company that you've all probably heard of at this point called Gazprom. Gazprom, uh, in 1999, traded at a 99.7% discount per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves to Exxon and BP. Why was it so cheap? 
It was so cheap because everybody in the stock market thought that everything had been stolen out of the company. I didn't know whether everything had or hadn't been stolen, and so I decided to do something which hadn't been done before, which was a, a stealing analysis of gas product. <coughs> now, how do you do a stealing analysis? Uh, this was not a, a um, subject they taught at Stanford Business School. <laughs> So um, what I decided to do was to um, make appointments, breakfasts, lunches, dinners, teas, coffees, desserts, with anybody who knew about the stealing, competitors, customers, suppliers, ex-employees, government officials, and sit them down and ask them how much is being stolen out of gas fraud. I didn't know whether anyone would respond, but I thought it was worth a try. And so I, sent out 40 invitations. About 30 people remarkably agreed to have these meals with me. And I had sat down for my first meeting and I discovered the most interesting cultural anomaly in Russia, which was that during the communist times, the richest person was six times richer than the poorest person. You might have had a, a dacha, a bigger apartment, maybe a car and a driver, but it wasn't dramatic. 10 years later, um, in 1999, um, the richest person in Russia was 250,000 times richer than the poorest person in Russia. And when you have that kind of immediate disparity of wealth, it poisons the psychology of a whole country. Um, and not necessarily for the right reasons. Most people were angry, um, not because it was bad, they were angry because they weren't included in the theft. <laughs> <laughs> However, they were angry. And so when I sat them down, to ask them about the stealing, people started spilling their guts. And I started writing it down. And people told me the most unbelievable, outrageous, shocking stories of theft, graft, and embezzlement. And I just wrote it all down. And I filled up two notebooks full of these stories, and it was just truly, truly shocking. The problem that I had <clears throat> was I didn't know if any of this stuff was true. It could have been sour grapes, could have been exaggeration, could have been slander. It was hard to know whether it was true. Um, I, we then had a lucky break. My head of research, a very intelligent Russian PhD named Vadim, um, was driving his car one day in Moscow shortly after we did these interviews. And he was, his car was at a, a traffic light at Pushkin Square. And Pushkin Square is a place where all the traffic in Moscow gets snarled up for quite a long time. And because of that, um, there, there's a sort of outdoor market that has emerged where these street urchins will start selling things to motorists who are sitting there at a traffic light. And these kids are selling bootleg cigarettes, they're selling pirated DVDs, they're selling lighters, they're selling newspapers, selling anything that they, that's, that they can sell. And it's interesting to see what people have for sale when you're stuck at a traffic light. And so Vadim rolled down his window, and this kid came up, and Vadim said, what do you got? He said, I'm selling disks. Well, well, what kind of disks? Databases. Well, what kind of databases do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and this kid said, well, I've, I've got the Moscow Registration Chamber database, for example. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, how, how much? Uh, five bucks. <laughs> which was probably five times more than he was ready to sell it for, but Vadim said, okay, sure, I'll take it for five bucks. So he bought it for five bucks, raced back to the office, put it into the computer, and sure enough, there was the Moscow Chamber, the Registration Chamber database, which showed the beneficial ownership of all Moscow-based companies and all transactions in those companies, which is something that we needed to prove um, some of the stuff that we had heard from these companies. There was also a telephone number on the disk for other databases, and so we called them. <laughs> We got a whole bunch of databases. And what we learned was that you know, uh, Russia, Russia is one of the most bureaucratic countries in the world. That, that um, everything that happens there is written down, and then there are like armies of bureaucrats typing it into databases. And, and some of these bureaucrats were selling their information to these database um, disk providers, um, <laughs> and we got them. And we got them, and we were able to then um, take all the allegations that we had heard in these um, crazy meetings and cross-reference them against the databases. And we discovered the most unbelievable thing that I've ever discovered about Russia. 
which was that between 1996 and 1999, nine members of management of Gazprom had stolen oil and gas reserves equal to the size of Kuwait. Wow. And nobody knew that. Um, now, if you recall, um, oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait that were stolen by another country led to a war in which America participated in, the First World War. <laughs> um, so, so, so that was the first thing we discovered. The second thing we discovered was equally unbelievable and amazing from a different standpoint, which was that oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait only represented 9.65% of Gazprom's total reserves. So coming back to the investment mindset, which is what my mindset was, um, the market was valuing the company at a 99.7% discount, assuming that everything had been stolen. And I've just discovered, with documents and facts, that more than 90% is still there. So when you see that type of anomaly as an investor, where the market thinks everything is gone, and you've discovered everything is there, what do you do as an investor? Well, I'll tell you what I did. I backed up the truck, as they say. <laughs> I backed up the truck and I bought every last share of gas pump I could get my hands on up to the limit that I was allowed to on the, uh, based on the terms of my fund. It became my single largest investment. Now normally, this is where a fund manager would stop. You find some interesting anomaly, you express your conviction about that anomaly by buying the shares, and then you wait for the world to figure it out. Well, I was a little bit impatient about waiting for the world to figure it out, and so I decided to share the information I had. And I broke the dossier down into seven chapters, and I gave one chapter to the Financial Times, one to Business Week, one to the New York Times, one to the uh, Washington Post, one to the Wall Street Journal, to show, to show them all the graft and theft that was going on so it was all quantified. And each of them wrote a story, and on the back of each of their stories, more stories were written, and more stories. And in the end, more than 500 stories were written about the graft and theft at Gazprom based on our <laughs> research, which led to a political crisis. The parliament then began debates in Russia about whether it was a good thing or a bad thing to have these assets stolen from your most important economy in the country. <laughs> um, the board of directors of Gazprom hired the famous American accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers to produce a report to say it was a good thing to steal these assets. <laughs> um, and in the end, um, uh, about a year later, um, Vladimir Putin, who had just newly been appointed, or I should say elected, uh, president uh, stepped into the into the Gazprom scandal at the annual annual journal meeting, <clears throat> and he um, fired the CEO who was responsible for all the stealing, and replaced him with a new CEO whose job it was not to steal assets. <laughs> 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 I stress assets. He can steal cash flow, just not assets. <laughs> But just on announcing that he wasn't going to steal assets on that day, the share price of Gazprom jumped 134%. It subsequently doubled again, and then it doubled again, and then it doubled again, and then it doubled again, and again. The share price of Gazprom from 1999 to 2005 went up 100 times. This is not some micro cap company, this was the largest company in the country and it was my largest single investment. So as you can imagine, I was feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> it's very rare. To, I mean, if, if there's a certain chemical release in your stomach making 10 times your money, can you imagine what that feels like when you make 100 times your money? So I was feeling pretty good about myself, and I decided that it's probably a good idea to do this to some other companies, and so I did it at the National Savings Bank, at the National Electricity Company. I did it at two oil companies. I did it um, at the oil pipeline company and a few others. And remarkably, I didn't have the same 100 baggers at all the companies, but I had a pretty amazing success. And, and the reason I had a success was something very unexpected, which was that I had an unwitting ally in none other than Vladimir Putin. When Vladimir Putin had come to power, um, he had come to power um, as the president, he was really only the president of the presidential administration of Russia. <laughs> 
because the oligarchs had stolen most of the powers of the presidency for themselves. And so one of his big objectives was to regain the power of the presidency. <clears throat> and to do that, he needed to fight the oligarchs. And so there was this weird guy from the south side of Chicago viciously attacking his enemies. And there's an expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so <clears throat> Vladimir Putin, and there was never any collusion between us, I never asked him or had any requests into him to do this, but every time he would publicize a, uh, a scandal, um, he would step in and do something like firing the CEO or issuing a presidential decree or passing a law, which would then um, disempower the oligarchs and empower me economically. And so as a result of this, my, um, my fund rose and rose and rose in value. Um, I ended up with four and a half billion dollars of assets under management in Russia, which would made, made me the largest foreign investor in the country. And it was really the most joyous time because I was not only making money, but I was doing good in the same job. And it's very rare that you can have a job where you can make money and do good. Oftentimes you can make money and not do good, or you can do good and not make money, but it's very rare to do both. And I had that job. And so I was feeling pretty good about myself. Now, the, um, uh, however, it, it, it's, it's one of these situations that's really too good to be true. And, and it all came to an end very abruptly at the end of 2003, when Putin won his war with the oligarchs, what he did was he arrested the richest oligarch in the country, a man named Michael Hordakovsky, I understand was actually here last week. And um, Michael Hordakovsky was arrested, and then Putin did something very unusual, which was that um, he allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom when Hordakovsky was on trial. And um, the television cameras came into the courtroom, and when somebody is on trial in Russia, there's no presumption of innocence. There's something like a 99.6% conviction rate. And so, just to save time, they keep oh people in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so the, um, the television cameras film the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. Now, imagine that you're the 17th richest man in Russia. And this is now in the summer of 2004. You're on your yacht. It's parked off the Hotel du Cap in Antibes in the French Riviera. Um, you've just finished with your mistress in the bedroom, and you go out to the, um, to the um, living room where the TV is, and you grab yourself a nice cold beer, and you flick on the CNN to see what's happening in the world. And there, right before your eyes, is a man far more successful than you, far more powerful than you, far better than you, sitting in a cage. What is your natural reaction going to be? You do not want to sit in that cage. And so one by one by one, the Russian oligarchs went back to Moscow in the fall of 2004 and went to Putin and said, Vladimir Vladimirovich, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in the cage? And Putin, and I wasn't there, so I'm, 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 I'm speaking sort of third hand anecdotal, but what I understand, his answer was very simple, 50%. <laughs> <laughs> Not 50% for the uh, presidential, for the government of Russia or for the presidential administration of Russia. 50% for Vladimir Putin. I can't prove this is true. There are no, no documents to prove it. None of this money is kept in, in his name. It's all kept in the name of the oligarchs who ran him this 50% or 60% or 40%, whatever the deal may be. Um, but what I can say for certain is that after that, he changed his attitude towards the oligarchs, and the oligarchs changed their attitude towards him. And he changed his attitude towards me. So I was carrying on with my naming and shaming campaigns into 2004 and 2005, but I was no longer going after Vladimir Putin's enemies. I was no, now going after Vladimir Putin's own economic interests. Uh, and on the evening of November 13, 2005, I was flying back into to Moscow after taking a weekend trip to London, and um, I was going through the VIP lounge at Sheridan Antibo 2 Airport. And what should have been a two minute exercise, um, they had me sit there for about 45 minutes and I started to get impatient. And just as I was standing up to ask questions about what was going on, four uniformed guards entered the VIP lounge, came to me, grabbed me, and frog marched me down to the basement of the airport where they kept the airport detention center. And then uh, opened the door, threw me in, locked it, and then there I was, sitting, sitting in, in a cell waiting to figure out what was going to happen to me. Now, I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be imprisoned in Russia or deported, and obviously deportation was a better option. 
And um, uh, finally, the next morning, they grabbed me again, and I didn't know again whether I was going to be taken out to the paddy wagon. But thankfully, they took me to a waiting aeroflot plane, put me in, uh, marched me down the aisle, stuck me into a seat, and deported me back to London. I learned a few weeks later that um, I had been uh, deported and declared a threat to national security. Now, at this point, I knew something, which was that when, when, if the Russians go after you, they don't tend to do so mildly, they do so with extreme prejudice. And so the, um, uh, and, and a deportation is hardly uh, a heavy sanction. And so I had two things that I needed to protect. I had an office full of people in Moscow, and I had a portfolio full of assets. And so I embarked as quickly as I could on getting my people out to evacuate my team, and to quickly and quietly sell all the securities we had in our portfolio. Now, the Putin regime is evil, and I can say that definitively, but they're very incompetent at exercising their evil. <laughs> <laughs> They allowed us to get everybody out, and they allowed us to get all of our assets out because they just hadn't gotten their act together yet on what they were going to do. And so, once everything was out, I thought to myself, well, what else can they do to me? That's the end of the story. Um, it might have been the end of the story for me, but it was just the beginning of the story for what they had in mind for me. Um, on June 4th, 2007, about 18 months after I was expelled from Russia, 25 police officers in Moscow raided my empty office. I had a secretary there, but nothing else. And 25 more officers raided the office of, of my American law firm, the firm that we used to administer our investment holding companies. They were specifically looking for the stamps, the seals, the certificates for those investment holding companies to which we had invested our money. And at the law firm, they found them. And they, the, the, they, they didn't know that our companies were empty at this time. Uh, so they grabbed all these documents, <coughs> took them away, and then the next thing we knew, several months later, we no longer owned our investment holding companies. Mm -hmm. The companies had been fraudulently re-registered using the documents seized by the police out of our name, into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early by the police to put his name on these documents. At this point, I was, I was worried and, and shocked because not because there was any economic downside to me, we got our money out, but I was worried and shocked that if the police were colluding with murderers to steal assets, God knows what other things they were doing and trumping up. And so I hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a guy named Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei was a 36-year-old lawyer. He worked for an American law firm. And he was the kind of guy who could do 10 things in the time that took other people to do one. He was the go-to guy for any complicated situation. And so I got Sergey involved, and I asked Sergey if he could, first of all, figure out what, what, it, what it is that these policemen and crooks are trying to do, and secondly, <clears throat> once we figured out, to stop them. And so Sergey went out and investigated, and it took him some time to figure it out, but they basically had two, two plans for me. One, which they didn't succeed in doing, was to steal our assets. As I said, we took everything out so they couldn't get our money. But, we saw, but Sergei was found all the documents, all the search warrants of the different banks and so on, where they were going around looking for assets they couldn't find. The second thing was something that they succeeded in doing. And the second thing involved our taxes. So when we were um, uh, liquidating our, our company, our holdings in Russia, um, we declared a profit of a billion dollars, and we paid a capital gains tax of $230 million. The bad guys went to the tax authorities about two days before Christmas, 2007, and said to them, there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filing. This $230 million that was paid shouldn't have been paid. It should be refunded. They applied for a $230 million tax refund, which was the largest tax refund in the history of Russia, two days before Christmas, and it was approved paid out the next day. The largest tax refund in Russian history paid out in one day on Christmas Eve. Now, anyone who's ever had a $5,000 tax rebate in any country usually takes a few years, but um, $230 million in Russia was done in one day. 
Now, many people think of Putin as being a nationalist. And that's what I thought back then. I thought, he might be a, a, not a bad guy, but isn't his whole shtick about acting in the national interest? And how could it possibly be in the national interest to allow some corrupt officials to steal $230 million? And so I figured, and Sergey, my lawyer, figured that if we were to put all this information into the hands of the authorities and into the public domain, um, that would be the end of the story. So we, we, we wrote um, uh, uh, nine criminal complaints filed in the Marine Law Enforcement and Regulatory Agency in Russia. We shared this information with the New York Times, with Vedomosti, the main business newspaper in Russia. And Sergei testified against the police officers involved. And we waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. It turned out, in the Putin regime, there are no good guys, only bad guys. Instead of doing anything to, get, to go after the people who stole the money, the same police officers who Sergei testified against came to his home on November 24th, uh, 2008, at 8 in the morning, in front of his wife and two children, uh, arrested Sergei, put him in pretrial detention, and then, began, and then the torture began to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates in eight beds and let the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he would froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They would move him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. They would sometimes not feed him for up to 36 hours. Sergei had gone into prison a robust and healthy 36-year-old man, and after six months of this, he had lost 40 pounds, developed terrible pains in his stomach, and was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones, and needing an operation that was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. Now, the reason that they were doing all this to him was they wanted to get him to withdraw his testimony against the police officers, and more cynically than that, they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he had stolen the $230 million, and they wanted him to then mean me as the mastermind behind it. And Sergei, I don't know how I would have behaved with this type of, under this type of duress. I don't think Sergei knew how he would behave in advance. But when he was faced with a choice between perjuring himself um, or um, uh, in order to, to improve his conditions, for him, the, uh, the moral pain of bearing false witness and perjuring himself was just much greater than the physical pain that he was suffering under, and he refused. And in retaliation for his refusal, they abruptly moved him one week before his operation to a prison called Butyrka, which is a maximum security prison in Moscow, considered to be one of the most awful prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there were no medical facilities there. And at Butyrka, Sergei's health completely broke down. He went into constant, agonizing, ear-piercing pain, <coughs> untreated, untreated pain. And it just got worse and worse. He and his lawyers desperately wrote requests to every different branch of the criminal justice system in Russia, begging for medical attention. And every single branch either ignored or even in writing denied his request for medical attention. On the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei's body uh, could no longer hold out. Into critical condition. On that night, the authorities of Butyrka decided to move him to a prison that had a medical facility, and they, moved, and they put him in an ambulance to another prison called Matryoshka Tishina. When he arrived at Matryoshka Tishina, instead of putting him in the emergency room, he was, he was led into an isolation cell, he was chained to a bed, and then eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him um, until an hour and 18 minutes later, uh, a civilian doctor found him on the floor dead. He was 37 years old. That was five and a half years ago, November 16, 2009. He left a wife and two children. I got the news on the 17th of November at 7.45 in the morning. And it was by far the most horrible, heartbreaking, life-changing news that I could have ever gotten. Sergei Magnitsky was killed because he worked for me. He was killed. <coughs> He was a middle-class lawyer who bought his Starbucks coffee in the morning and did his tax work in his cubicle. And only because he, he was my lawyer, I was his client, 
did he get involved in this thing? And by getting involved in this thing, and by being a patriot for his own country, he was plucked out of his normal life and put in the worst dungeon that anyone could be put in and slowly tortured to death. And for me, it was a complete heartbreak scenario. And I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do it. Any, everything and anything to make sure that the people who did this face justice. And so I made a vow to his memory, to his family, and to myself that I was going to go after the people who did this and make sure that that uh, they get prosecuted for what they did. Now, in theory, that shouldn't have been such a tall order. Sergei Magnitsky did something which is very unusual, which, which made it, should have made it a lot easier. Sergei Magnitsky, unlike any other prisoner, wrote it all down. I think he had some type of premonition about what was going to happen, and he wrote it all down in the form of 450 complaints that he filed in his 358 days in detention. Many people ask me, how is it possible that they allow these complaints to be filed? And the answer is, is very interesting, which is that Russia is a highly unjust place, but they're absolutely slavishly wedded to their procedure. And this is one of the procedures that's allowed, and so they, they allowed him to file these complaints. He filed these complaints saying who did what to him, where, how, when, and why. Every complaint was either ignored or denied. Um, but I've got copies of them. And because I have copies of them, we have the most well-documented, granular evidence of human rights abuses come out of Russia in the last 35 years. And so I would have thought that <clears throat> the Russian authorities would have to prosecute somebody. Maybe not everybody, but at least the obvious executors of this crime. But it turns out that I was wrong. Instead of prosecuting anybody, and they exonerated every single person involved. They gave special state honors to some of the most complicit on the one-year anniversary of Sergei's murder. <clears throat> and the only two people who have ever been prosecuted in this story was Sergei Magnitsky himself, three years after they killed him, in the first ever trial and conviction against a dead man in the history of Russia. Even Stalin didn't prosecute dead people. And I was prosecuted as Sergei's <clears throat> co-defendant in absentia and sentenced to nine years in absentia in Russian prison. In the courtroom, there were two empty seats for me and Sergei. There was a judge, there were prosecutors, there were defense attorneys, there were court reporters, there were guards. The only two people who were missing were the defendants. So it became clear to us that if we wanted to get justice for Sergei, we were gonna to have to do it outside of Russia. But when I look at, at how you get justice outside of Russia, I discovered pretty quickly that there are no mechanisms to get justice outside of a country when a, an atrocity like this has been committed. They just don't exist. And so I, I said to myself, if they don't exist, then we're gonna to have to create one. And so I looked at this whole situation, and I said, why did they kill Sergei Magnitsky? They killed him for simple, one simple reason, $230 million. They killed him because they wanted to cover up their involvement in this crime. The people who get that $230 million don't like to keep that money in Russia because as easily as they stole it, it could be stolen from them. And so what do they do? They keep their money in the West. They keep their money in New York, in London, in Paris, in Frankfurt, in Zurich. They like to travel to these countries, spend their money in these countries, send their kids to school in these countries, send their girlfriends and their wives to their shopping in these countries. And so I came up with an idea, which was, we may not be able to prosecute them for torture and murder, but we can certainly try to ban them from traveling and spending their money in the West. And so I took this idea to Washington in 2010, shortly after Sergei died. And I met, my first meeting was with a senator from Maryland, a Democrat named Benjamin Carr, who was a liberal Democrat. And I told him the story that I just told you. And I said, would you be willing to put together a law a Sergei Magnitsky law <clears throat> to ban visas and freeze assets. And he said yes. I then went to a conservative Republican from Arizona, John McCain. I told him the same story. I asked him if he would do this. He said yes. And Senators Cardin and McCain in October of 2010 came up with the Sergei Magnitsky Act, which would ban visas and freeze assets for these people. Moments after they launched the act, a number of Russian human rights activists and opposition politicians came forward, including Boris Nemtsov, whose name many of you will know is the man who was murdered on February 27th. And Boris and others said to them, 
you've hit the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. This is what they care about most. If there's one thing you could do for us in Russia, it would be to pass this law, but don't just pass it for Sergei Magnitsky, pass it for all of us, so that all Russian human rights abusers would be subject to this law. And these senators realize they're onto something much bigger than one case, and they're, they're onto a new technology for dealing with human rights abuse. And so they added 65 words to the law to include all other gross human rights abusers in Russia. And then the, 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 the whole thing snowballed very quickly. And in November of 2012, um, the Senate held their vote, and they voted 92 to 4 in favor of the Magnitsky Act. The House of Representatives held their vote 89% in favor. And on the 14th of December of 2012, President Obama signed it into law. There are now more than 30 people on the Magnitsky list. Their names are on the same sanctions list as ISIS and Al-Qaeda terrorists, Colombian and Mexican narco-traffickers. And now they can no longer open bank accounts anywhere in the world. They can't do business with any American companies. They obviously can't travel to America. But most significantly, when the Putin regime eventually falls, and all, all these regimes eventually fall, and all of these bad guys want to flee and get asylum, in the West, the UK authorities or the French authorities or the US authorities are going to say, well, wait a second, we, we're not going to give you asylum, we're going to arrest you because you're on the Magnitsky list, you're a human rights abuser. And that's the most existentially scary thing for any of these bad guys. So the um, uh, Magnitsky Act um, is not justice, it's not justice, the real justice for me will be when the regime does fall, that the first tribunals of the crimes of the previous regime will be the Magnitsky uh, tribunals. But it's a heck of a lot better than the absolute impunity that's been enjoyed by these people so far. Now, I'm proud to say on Sergei's behalf that in January this year, the same senators who passed the, the, the Russian Magnitsky Act have introduced something called the Global Magnitsky Act. And the Global Magnitsky Act will do the same for Uzbek, Venezuelan, Chinese, and various other human rights abusers wherever they may be as Magnitsky Act did for Russian human rights abusers. And it's, a, it's an absolute fitting legacy for Sergei that his death wasn't a meaningless death, that his death will hopefully create consequences which may save other people's lives. And so that, that's the sort of prepared part of my speech, but I'd be really glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Please, uh, Glenn, we've got something right down here in the, in the coral sweater. We'd like to ask a question. We'd like to make sure that you ask your question on the mic, okay? What is the current situation with his wife and children? Um, <clears throat> so when, when Sergei died, I stepped into his shoes to look after his wife and children, and thankfully they're um, living outside of, of Russia in the United Kingdom, away from, from the horrors that they experienced and they're uh, doing physically well, I think, but having to recover from that type of trauma and no one ever recovers. So, no, they're doing okay. Hi, Larry, it's Tim Martinez, and I'm from Stanford and support the program for the Stanford Miss Russia Forum. Uh, my question is regarding the future. Uh, I'd be very interested to hear your comments uh, about uh, the circumstances under which you would possibly, if at all, consider investing in Russia at a future date. Uh, I think the removal of Vladimir Putin or any of the further developments that would uh, allow you to uh, make such a decision. Uh, well, as you can imagine, um, in a situation where um, they tried to steal all of my assets and then kill my lawyer and, and want, effectively want to kill me, it's probably not a hospitable investment climate. <laughs> well, um, I, I've never met an investor that hasn't had some version of this happen to them. It's it's an uninvestable country. In any country where where the um, where the government acts as a mafia organization, unfortunately, makes it that um, where 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 the, the the risks are incalculable because if there's any chance of people dying, um, that's, there's no risk reward that, that justifies that. Um, I can imagine. Um, 
I was actually in Dallas a couple days ago, and um, I was taken to a man's house who has a collection of um, statues of former dictators. It's called the Garden of Fallen Dictators. <laughs> It was very, it was very uplifting for me. It's actually one of those mean <laughs> because there, there was Mao, and there was Ceausescu, and there was Stalin, and there was Lenin, and there was all these people, and Brezhnev, and, and, um, and Saddam Hussein, and and, and um, Putin is not going to last forever. I don't know what's going to happen after Putin, and, and I can imagine that, that maybe one day um, I'll have a hero's welcome back in Russia. I love the country. I love the people. Uh, there's 140 million good Russians and a million very bad ones who are occupying the country. And um, under the right circumstances, I'm glad to return, but not under the circumstances of, of this um, criminal state that's currently in power. You know, thinking about this for years, what, what could people like us do uh, that, that help your vision of the future take place? Well, the, this assumes that we have any power at all in the West. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 was, um, uh, I was on campus yesterday meeting with a, with a bunch of uh, professors here, and, and, uh, and, and Mr. Keller as well, and the same question was asked, is, what should the West policy be? And, and you know, the answer is that, that the, whatever we do is, is gonna be very, very much on the margin. Ultimately, what's gonna happen in Russia is gonna be determined by the Russians. And the Russians are going to determine what they want to do based on two competing forces. One is how angry they are, and the second is how scared they are. And if the anger overcomes the fear, then, then eventually they will correct the horrible injustices that have been inflicted on them. And if the fear overcomes the anger, then they will live with it unhappily for a long time. And there are examples around the world of both. In Iran and in North Korea and Zimbabwe, the fear has overcome the anger. And in Tunisia and Ukraine and, and Egypt and various other places, the anger overcame the fear. And nobody really can predict that because it's incalculable. Um, do you think Putin's own do you think Putin's land grab is soft in eastern Ukraine or do you know, or if not, where do you think he's gonna head? Well, so first of all, my theory about Ukraine is different than the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is that somehow we provoked Putin by not giving him enough respect that NATO encircled them and therefore this was a natural response and there was some kind of uh, historic ties to Crimea that were just um, overwhelming. None of these theories make sense to me. The theory that makes the most sense to me is that, is that when Putin got that 50-50 deal, that I described earlier in my presentation, he became the richest man in the world. And um, that was okay while people were getting better off in Russia, but it wasn't okay when people's standard of living stagnated and started getting worse. And so when Putin saw what I would describe as a junior varsity version of himself in the president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, being overthrown by people with pitchforks in Maidan Square, Putin knew that it was just a matter of time before they did the same thing in Russia and Red Square. And so in order to preempt that from happening, he did what, a, a method which is tried and true and been used over many centuries, um, which was to start a war. And the first part of the war was going after Crimea, which was very costless because they already had their troops there. Um, and at the same time as they started the war, they, um, they also started a, a huge propaganda campaign to say that the Ukrainians were Nazis and fascists that were going to ethnically cleanse the good Russian-speaking people of eastern Ukraine. And so the Russians were worrying about their brothers and sisters in eastern Ukraine, and so fully supported Putin's invasion of Crimea, which led to an approval rating jumping from 55 to 88 percent, assuming you believe the approval ratings. Um, however, he couldn't stop there because um, uh, people now were convinced that there are these Nazi fascists that are going to do all sorts of terrible things. So he had to then go into eastern Ukraine, and, and by going into eastern Ukraine, they made the big mistake of shooting down a civilian aircraft, which then led to very severe sanctions. Very severe sanctions have led to an economic, partially led to an economic crisis, the other part is the oil price. With an economic crisis, people are angrier, you need more of a distraction. More of a distraction will lead to more escalation in Ukraine. Forget about any of these ceasefires, it's all tactical. But eventually, Putin is going to set his eyes on the Baltics. And that's where the real trouble lies, because the Baltics, um, have 
One thing which is different than Ukraine, which is they are members of NATO, and NATO has some a part of the NATO treaty. It's called Article Five. Is one for all and all for one, which means that um, one one of two things happen. Um, either he goes into the Baltics, and we then go to war with Russia, or he goes into the Baltics and we find an excuse not to go to war with Russia, which then destroys the credibility of NATO. Either of those two things are highly dangerous and lead to all sorts of terrible things in the future. Nobody knows. Putin doesn't know. We don't know. It's all very uncertain, but very scary. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions regarding the Ukraine war. First, if I understood correctly, your initial investment were based on the focus and judgment of the, of the Russians. And so I was wondering if mean, that good advisor at the time, and how do you explain the fact that you know, this price uh, company is up there? And then my second question, at the time of the, of the Gazprom investment, I mean, did you have a feeling that your plane was fired, or were you perfectly, you felt perfectly safe, or I mean, did, before things turned back? Um, the, um, uh, the, the people who came up with the idea of mass privatization um, was sort of a combination of uh, crooks in the Russian government and well-meaning Western advisors from Harvard and other universities. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, there's sort of what they call economic shock therapy people. Um, and it was truly an awful policy. You know, people, people um, uh, anybody, there's no question, it's pro to totally proven to be awful that 39% uh, of the country could end up in the hands of 22 individuals. And, um, <coughs> um, and so that, it was, you know, uh, nobody, nobody could, could, could prove of that. Um, uh, and the second question is um, uh, that I think Gazprom, I was playing with fire with Gazprom, you know, to do what I did, to go to Russia in the first place, and then to become a corporate uh, anti-corruption activist, you know, you kind of have to sort of take your risk detectors and sand them down. Um, because everything I did in Russia, it was kind of, I was almost sort of, it was all very incremental. I sort of got there, it was sort of crazy to go there, and I got there, and then, you know, every day kind of came and something happened. And, and, and the, the increments, I was, I was kind of surprised that nothing happened. And, and part of the reason nothing happened is that um, every, nothing in Russia, everybody in Russia has a conspiracy theory. Nothing is as it seems. If you know any Russians, that nobody believes anything on the surface, because most of it isn't right on the surface. And so people look at the situation. Here's this guy from Chicago who barely speaks Russian, who's busy taking on the most powerful, dangerous company in the world. There's no way he would be doing that on his own volition. So then they're saying, well, who, whose volition was he doing it on? Ah. Well, look, look, here's his pattern of behavior. He goes out there and exposes this stuff, and then Putin sticks it. Well, it's pretty clever of Putin. He's got this like guy from Chicago doing his, his stuff. That's really interesting. And then, then they say, well, we better not touch that guy from Chicago, because that would be touching Putin. And so for a number of years, I was actually untouched because of this misconception about, um, that, that I was Putin's guy. And I wasn't going to <laughs> disabuse anybody of that, because it kept me safe. Are you in any way? Uh involved in the present investigation of Gazprom? In the present investigation of Gazprom. No, so I think what, what you're referring to is the EU antitrust exactly. investigation. Right now, the EU has opened up an antitrust investigation into Gazprom, and no, I'm not. Um, what amazes me about the EU's antitrust investigation is not that they're doing it now, but that they didn't do it for like 10 years. <laughs> um, We're going to take one more question. We have some books to sell and some books to sign. Um, I'm wondering if you still require a great deal of security um, and whether you fear that there will be retribution against you for Putin. That's one. The second thing is, what are you doing now? And third is, when do I see the movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what, what, what I am doing now is, is um, we're just in the process. So I, I've written this book. It's called Red Notice. That's the cover over there. Um, Red Notice refers to the Interpol International Arrest Warrant, which Russia has issued for me three times to try to get me back there. Thankfully, Interpol has rejected that. Uh, Russia has tried to extradite me, arrest me through Interpol, sue me in different courts. 
Um, they they threatened to kill me, to kidnap me, to do all sorts of other terrible things. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go into my uh, security arrangements with you here. Uh, <laughs> the but um, what, what, what I will say is that book is one of my security arrangements because I've laid it all out. You know, so if something happens to me, it will become a major political issue because we'll know exactly who's behind it. Um, uh, and to answer your third question, it's obvious that if you want to change the world, you make a Hollywood movie, so that's something that's <laughs> <laughs>